so we're really, really pleased to have Carol Reedy here today. She's a PhD candidate in Hispanic linguistics, just finishing up her dissertation, mm -hmm. and um, has been a wonderful supporter of Carla, and um, we have her here today. So her talk today is on the discourse of Moroccan immigrants in Grenada, Spain, contested identities and conflicting ideologies. So please welcome Carol. Thank you. Yes, thanks for coming out today, especially on this cold day. Um, but we're going to sort of transport ourselves to Granada and the context of Granada, which is very hot in the summer. So we'll just try and picture that while, for the duration of, of my talk and really uh, appreciate the cold that we have. So as a sociolinguist, I'm interested in a lot of questions related to language use and social factors. And in particular, in the case of migrant languages, I'm interested in how migrants are able to navigate and negotiate their, their identities and their surroundings using language. How do they create space for themselves in their new communities and do they maintain ties to their origins? These questions have come to the forefront in places like Spain where immigration has in, uh, increased over the past years. And identity, things like identity and language use and cultural practices um, have come under uh, debate and discussion. So, but before we get into my project and discussing the answers to some of these questions, I'm going to describe a little bit about the uh, uh, situation of immigration in Spain and talk specifically to the situation of Moroccans in Spain and then within, within the context of Granada. I'll then go into the specific objective of my project and some of the questions that I'd like to answer. So today, just as a disclaimer, we're only looking at a couple pieces of these broader questions. Um, if we were to look at the full answer to these questions, we would be here for much longer than an hour. Um, and so I'm happy to take questions um, in the Q&A and talk more about that. But I'm going to argue several things. First, I will argue that despite constant scrutiny and surveillance, Moroccan immigrants are able to leverage features from multiple languages in discourse, and by doing so, are able to align themselves in sophisticated ways with multiple positions. These positions then are, allow them to facilitate access to spaces where they're typically denied. But then looking at the attitudes of these speakers, we see that there's some uh, an example of agency and constraint, right? Some conflict there in terms of how speakers perceive themselves, their own language use, um, and then sort of the, the ideologies that they're, they're coming up against in these contexts, okay? So, before getting into that, let's look at immigration in Spain. Uh, since the mid-80s, immigration to Spain has been steadily increasing. The percentage of immigrants in Spain went from 4% in 2010 to almost 13% in 2017. This is quite a jump for, uh, for Spain in comparison to other Western European countries. Um, Spain is a relatively new migrant co uh, country, right? Moroccans make up the largest migrant group in Spain, and they make up 1.7% of the total population. For those of you who may not know, Morocco lies just south of Spain across the Strait of Gibraltar. Okay. In Spain, with the increase of Moroccan immigrants, uh, questions around no national identity and language use have come to the forefront. Mor uh, Moroccan immigrants in Spain are oftentimes considered unable or unwilling to participate in Spanish society because of their religious, cultural, and linguistic practices, which are perceived to be very different from those of Spanish society, as opposed to immigrants from other Western, even Eastern European uh, countries, or immigrants from Latin American countries who already have uh, the language um, Spanish, right? Oftentimes, immigrants, Moroccan immigrants in Spain are often considered to be poorly integrated because of their, their maintaining their linguistic and cultural practices. And this is something that we see within public discourse and in the media. For example, in this headline in El País, um, it says that Moroccan immigrants in Spain are the least integrated in all of Europe. Not just in Spain, but all of Europe, right? Using Arabic in this context, or Darija or Fusha, the language of Moroccans, is oftentimes associated with Islam, and Islam associated with terrorism. And so because of this, this link, Moroccan immigrants oftentimes face discrimination in housing, education, and the job market. Um, and this is, again, also prevalent in uh, discourse of, uh, in media, where we see this headline, Spaniards turn their backs on Moroccan immigrants. Okay? In the context of Granada, 
it's, uh, there's an added layer of complexity because many Moroccan immigrants have settled where Moriscos, uh, converted to Christians of Muslim ancestry, lived before their expulsion in the 17th century. And so Moroccan's presence within this region is sort of perceived as the return of the medieval Moor. So for those of you who may not know, that's not necessarily a positive uh, characterization, right? This, this idea of this uh, person invading uh, the space of Spaniards, right? In, in Granada, Moroccans are the largest foreign-born population. And they make up 27% of the foreign-born population. The majority of Moroccans in Granada are students, business owners, and workers in agricultural and service industries. And we see that they navigate these spaces very frequently. There's in, in downtown Granada, um, there are a lot of business, like shops and, and tourist um, uh, restaurants and things that attract tourists where many Moroccans work um, and conduct their business. But there's also, you know, different regions within the city where, where Moroccans reside, right? Moroccans in this context use a variety of different languages, as we see in this chart. This chart represents just the different uh, language combinations that we see within this context. So both first and second generation Moroccan immigrants use a variety of different languages in their daily lives. They use Darija. Darija is Moroccan Arabic, so it's unique to, to Morocco. Fusha is standard Arabic, which you may hear in places like Morocco, but also in Egypt and other Arabic-speaking countries. Uh, Spanish, French, and even Tamasikt in some cases. Uh, Tamasikt is an indigenous language of uh, North Africa and uh, parts of other parts of Morocco as well. So as a sociolinguist, this information is interesting to me, but I'm also curious, again, back to this idea of the social factors of language use. I'm interested in seeing, you know, what, what are the different social aspects that play into this language use. So that's where my project comes in. In my project, I examine the linguistic practices of Moroccan immigrants in Spain and how these practices are used to negotiate multilingual and multicultural identities in a society that blames them for their lack of willingness to integrate. Okay? I also examine how language use and identity may be linked to dominant discourses and ideologies. So it's, it's hard to determine what really is the role, what's the role of, of attitudes and ideologies in terms of language use. And you know, while, we, while we can't say that they necessarily affect each other, there is some interesting information to, to be um, gleaned from analyzing ideologies and attitudes of these, of these speakers, right, in this context. Today we'll be focusing on several different parts of these aspects. Again, not the full picture here. We only have uh, 40 minutes. Um, looking at, at identity and how identity is constructed in discourse within um, the discourse of Moroccan immigrants in Granada, but also looking at how they sort of perceive their, their language use um, in relation to uh, these, these uh, larger um, generalizations that they, they experience, right? So looking at um, this through the lens, we, we see in my research questions um, to guide this project, we see that, um, sorry, taking a sociolinguistic approach, we look at the identities and how identities are enacted through language practices. So to explore identity in language practices, I look at the ways that speakers use different resources from languages and how these resources may be used to set them apart or align them with others. So looking specifically at how speakers position themselves within interviews and how features are leveraged with this positioning, okay? Um, and then the last question, of course, ref referencing um, the identities and our attitudes and ideologies, what attitudes and ideologies are linked to such practices, okay? So to answer these questions, I take a linguistic ethnographic approach, uh, which allows me to look at specific linguistic and discursive structures, but also maintain a uh, perspective of the, and, and have re reflexive practices, which are required of, of an ethnography. So what that means is that I, while I look at specific structures, I also take into account uh, the experience of the, the individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I consult my field notes and also my re own reflective notes of living and working within uh, this community, and also uh, rely on consultants, I guess participants, them as sort of consultants in, in making sense of some of this data, okay? Today we're gonna be looking at specifically the results um, of the, some results of the questionnaires and some results of the sociolinguistic interviews. But 
not all of it, just a few, just a few pieces from that. Okay. The data that, we, that we'll look at today and for that form the base of my project come from sociolinguistic interviews and questionnaires completed with 58 uh, participants. I completed sociolinguistic interviews with 31st generation and 28 second generation Moroccan immigrants. I asked them questions about their experience moving to and living in Spain. I asked questions to elicit social demographic information, which is quite com common in sociolinguistic interviews. I asked them about their experiences going back, to, um, back and forth from Morocco and Spain, which languages they used and when. And the questionnaires, I asked them specifically about uh, their language background. So I developed the, the questionnaire based on the bilingual language profile and I made it a multilingual language profile to reflect the multilingual uh, practices that I saw within the community. And so it asked them questions about their own language use within their family and friends, workplace, school, and things of that nature. Okay. When looking at the, uh, the data and analyzing the data, I first transcribed the interview data. I then coded the data manually for instances of different words or themes that, that uh, were used or mentioned. And, um, I consulted also my field notes and uh, talked with my participants to verify that these themes were, were accurate and really um, did come up from, from the data. I then imported the data into InVivo, which is a qualitative uh, data analysis tool. And I identified larger, broader themes and then subtopics of these, of these themes. And then I um, went from the bottom up, stepped these smaller, verified these smaller topics and going to the larger themes. Um, I did this for the sociolinguistic interviews and also the field notes, but we'll just be looking at some of the interview excerpts today. In the quanti quantitative analysis, I completed uh, descriptive statistics, but also um, have completed uh, some statistical testing on, on the, where, it, where it's appropriate, um, but we'll just see a couple of the questionnaire results that haven't been statistically tested, and I think it's uh, more rich to look at the descriptive, descriptive results in this, in this sense. So going back to the sociolinguistic interviews, so I said that I was going to look at it by positioning, and so looking at the positioning framework, um, this framework helps me understand how identity is, can, can be constructed and negotiated in discourse. And it does, does this by identifying three different layers of, of this type of positioning. So the, the first layer refers to how characters are positioned in relation to one another in the story world. So that's here, the, the first level that's uh, marked by Las Meninas, the painting here, if you don't know, and uh, the color purple, right? So that is how, if the speaker is telling a story, how are the characters within that story positioned with each other, right? And what can that tell me about this, the, the person telling the story, but also um, how they might be framed in that story if they are in that story as well. Um, level two refers to the way the narrators, nar narrators position themselves vis-a-vis -vis their interlocutors in the storytelling world. And that, in that case, it is the sociolinguistic interview world. That is, how is the speaker positioning himself, their self in relation to, to me, the interviewer? How am I negotiating my positioning uh, as well? And this level um, really helps to take into account the sociolinguistic interview for what it is as, as the interactional context and the event where, where the uh, negotiation occurs. Level three references how the speakers position a sense of self or identity with regard to dominant discourses and ideologies. So in this sense, it indicates how a speaker, speaker positions themselves in relation to dominant discourses. How do they construct themselves as a particular type of person within the environment that they're in, right? Within the social, political, economic, and cultural environment that they're in. How do they position themselves in terms of some generalizations that, um, that often come up in those contexts? So, before we get to the main finding, do you all have this handout? Okay, perfect. So we'll go through some of these excerpts based on the positioning. And again, if you remember, I'm gonna be arguing several, three, three main findings. And so the first finding that we'll, that we'll see throughout this analysis is that speakers are able to, to leverage a variety of different uh, resources Right? So the, the fluid language practices were leveraged in interviews to negotiate speakers' positions as members of various communities. The speakers' positions within this, these contexts facilitated social identities, which challenged previous notions of ethno-nationalist and ethno-linguistic identifications. Right? So we see these, this fluid language use is really mobilized to position the speaker in a certain way. 
So in this first excerpt, because there's a lot of interesting things going on, what we'll do first is we'll listen to the recording because there's some really cool code switching uh, as well. We'll, see, we'll, see, we'll hear features from Darija, Moroccan Arabic, Fusha, Standard Arabic, Spanish, and French, okay? Um, and then I will read the, the excerpt and we'll talk about the, the positioning, okay? So let's listen to the example. And this is a first-generation speaker, 19-year-old um, who is a student at the University of Granada. Okay, so really cool language use as a linguist. This was really exciting. And this is only like a minute and maybe 10, 20 seconds, but it took me like two days <laughs> to, to get all the different pieces. So there's a lot of interesting things going on. Um, we're only going to be looking at a couple really uh, s uh, significant and specific instances of positioning because you could write, you know, five pages on the analysis of, of just this excerpt. But we'll look at just a, a few key things um, with this, okay? Um, but let me read it first before we get into that positioning. Amal says, huh, I think the people here, uh, Spaniards that say, uh, the Arabs that say uh, Arab are only the, the Arabs from Saudi Arabia and have money. Mm -hmm. But when it's in uh, Arab from Algeria, it's a normal person, normal. Working, working, for example, in a cafeteria or have in, I don't know, in Maripas, in the shoe store. That's not an Arab, that's a Moro. Mm. You understand? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Wow. But for the, if they have money, Arab. If they don't have money, Moro. Hmm. A lot of the time people get confused and you say, Ara but Arabs? How many of us are Arab? So, uh, um, Arab, I think it's a race. Mm -hmm. It's an ethnicity. It's pretty. I don't have a problem with, uh, when you say that I'm an Arab, okay, there's no problem. So, you, you are Arab. Arab, African, um, Berber, Berber, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. A mix. Okay. So, there's a lot of really interesting things going on here. And I just want to point out that we're seeing features, again, from a, a lot of different, different languages, right? She's using Fusha, standard Arabic. She's using Darija. One of the really key markers here of Darija that we hear is Mashi, like no, not, uh, not uh, Arab, that's Moro, Uwaha, um, things like that, right? So, in this case, in positioning level one, again, positioning level one is how the the, the characters are positioned to each other within the story world, right? So in, within this little account that Amal is telling, how are Spaniards positioned in relation to Arabs, in relation to Moroccans? How are we seeing these different positionings? So here, also with herself as a, as a main character in this context, we see that she positions herself, she says, here, Spaniards, right? 
Um, in this context, it's important to note that Amal and I had this discussion earlier. We had a discussion about whether she would stay in Spain, and she said that she uh, was hoping to to uh, build a life in Spain and stay in Spain. But she's in this excerpt, she's referring to Spaniards as separate here, and it, so this this context of of this place belonging and connecting with this particular identity, right? We also see that using features from Darija, French, uh, Fusha, and Spanish, she positions herself as Moroccan, but also other identifications, right? We see the use of French in, in uh, Morocco in particular also indexes a set of characteristics, right? It may index in, in Morocco that one has access to education, that one pertains to a particular social class, right? And the use of fusa also marks something uh, similar, right? Someone that has access to education, has gone through the education system in Morocco, since fusa is the, the language of instruction in Morocco. And so it's someone that has, has had access to education, has gone through the educational system, and also able to use fusa, right? Using fusa in French is significant in this context, in the context of, of Morocco, because it indexes this higher social status. Right? But she also uses Spanish. And Spanish in Spain, of course, in the context of Granada, is sort of what's expected for her in this situation. Right? So she's indexing these different identities and then explicitly makes these identities more apparent in the end when she uh, positions herself in, in relation to me, the, the interviewer, and she explains that she is fully all of these things. The only thing that we don't see here is use of, ber use of Berber or tamasikt. Right? Um, but that may also be because, as the, as the interviewer, she knows that I speak Fusa and that I can that I can speak Darija and Spanish, and I can speak French. But and so she may be using those uh, features from those languages, knowing that I will be able to to connect with that. Okay. In positioning level two, again, positioning how how she positions herself with me, how I position myself with her. We see that she uses standard features from standard Arabic, so fusha with me, right, as an outsider. Uh, fusha is oftentimes connected to this, this broader identity of, of the Arab world and is used oftentimes with uh, Moroccans and other speakers of the Arabic speaking world, right, as sort of a, sort of a lingua franca because Darija is perceived as, as very different from Fusha, right? So possibly seeing me as an outsider, very obviously an outsider in this context, using Fusha with me sort of creates this, this type of relationship where she, she sees my outsider status, okay? And then again in line 10 when she uses Spanish with me. Um, not highlighted here, but important to note in 13 and, and you know, my, in my sort of responses here, I use Fusha with her to, again, try and align myself with the speaker, right? And, and demonstrate that, okay, yes, while I am an outsider in many ways, I am, a, you know, I'm hoping to present myself in alignment with you to sort of support this, uh, this interaction, okay? Looking at positioning level three, we see several different things, in particular with this idea of these, this pan-Arab identity, which is not necessarily something that we see uh, very frequently within this, this, the, uh, Spain, but within the Arabic-speaking world, right? In, in Arabic speaking, the Arabic-speaking world, this Arab identity is important, right? It connects, um, it connects speakers through different cultural, religious, and even linguistic practices, and so this idea of Arab connects her, this uh, Arab identity is particularly rooted in this understanding of, of what it means to be Arab in, in Morocco as well, right? Being a multilingual speaker, uh, using French, Fusa and Darija, right? So she's not necessarily just posi positioning herself as an Arab, but also as a Moroccan, as a Berber, as Spanish, in all of these different ways. But again, with this influence of this generalization of what it means to be an Arab, right? Is, is being an Arab does that mean to be multilingual? Um, and that's, in this case, this speaker is sort of indicating that that's definitely part of it, right? So, let's look at the second finding and the second example. So we see that the identity positions which support multilingual practices also allow speakers to perform belonging in various social spaces. So it's not just the 
multi, multilingual language use, but actually the idea of multilingualism and multiculturalism that can also be, be used to support these, uh, these positions, right? So let's look at the example of Lulu here, and I'll read this example. She says, yes, it's kind of a long story, but I, in high school I always wanted to do engineering and I did my high school degree in science. I studied science, all science, nothing to do with liberal arts, and a mathematic chick hardcore. But when I finished high school, I had an identity crisis. I left my house. Well, I had something like, I didn't know what to do with my life, almost, almost the same because I was like between two worlds. My family asked me to do one thing and I wanted to do something else. My family always like pressured me to the Arab world, to the Moroccan world, to the world of my origins. And I was like, okay, I come from here and one thing doesn't have anything to do with the other. So fine, I decided to join the police force, but not at the entry level, at the executive level. And for, for that, you need a bachelor's degree. So in that moment, I said, what major can help with that? Or what can, once I'm in the police corps, and what knowledge would help me be mm, better, like to stand out? It's the thing that I'm Moroccan. So, okay, I'm Moroccan, I can speak it, but without reading it or writing it, it's like half Moroccan. You understand? I didn't know how to write my name, and I said, well, I will get into translation. I will get into a major that lets me know my origin. But knowing the background to reading, reading, be like a full Moroccan. It was like I wasn't a complete Moroccan because I didn't even know how to write my name. And people would say, write my name. But I didn't know how to write. My, how to write. So what Moroccan are you that you don't know how to write? The language is, is like I said before, it's important. Okay. So just a quick little anecdote that ties in with this too. Writing your name in Arabic is significant for even learners of Arabic. When I started learning Arabic, and I know many of my friends who started learning Arabic, when we were able to finally sort of master the, the alphabet in Arabic and write our names, it was a very significant moment. It was like we had achieved sort of this, this new way of understanding ourselves and, and, and this new knowledge, right? That, was, that marked us as different. Being able to write your name is significant. So again, we, we see this here as well, which is, which is interesting, we'll, we'll talk about. So looking at the first level positioning, we see that Lulu first positions herself away from her family, right? She, she doesn't want to have anything to do with this Arab, Moroccan, her origins. She doesn't want anything to do with it. But then once she realizes that, it, that this position can actually be helpful for her in achieving what she wants to achieve, particularly in this context, right? We see that she later aligns herself again. But it's important to note that through this alignment, she's not getting rid of this Spanish position and the Spanish identity. She's adding on to the, the, the Spanish uh, identification with her Moroccan Arab position and subject, subject position, okay? She also makes this clear in relation to me, the, the interviewer, where she, she highlights her Moroccan identity, in particular with me, right, the, the interviewer. Um, it's important to note that when I asked these, these uh, speakers to participate in my study, I asked them for people who identified as Moroccan to participate, right? So that was already some self-selection. But this is also brought up within the interview, right? She, she knows that that's what I'm interested in, so she makes that clear to me, the interviewer, that that's who she is and that's why she's here and that's what, what is uh, the, the key point of this, of this story. In positioning level three, again, how the speaker positions himself in relation to these dominant uh, ideologies and discourses, we see this idea of being half Moroccan. And this is not unlike, we hear a lot of times with uh, heritage Spanish speakers in the United States that they may feel this sort of, this half identity for being born in the United States and growing up in a predominantly English uh, context. So we see this also here in the case of Lulu. But previously in this interaction, Lulu explained to me that when she's talking about language, she's talking about Arabic in particular, she is referencing both Darija and Fusha. Fusha is written where Darija is oral. Okay? So being a full Moroccan implies the knowledge of both of these languages. right? Um, while Darija is going, undergoing some standardization within, within Morocco, um, it's still quite 
polemic within the context of Morocco, and it's not, it does not have a co-official status within, within Morocco. So this idea to be fully Moroccan requires both the knowledge and the skill in Darija and Fusha. And in this, in this way, she places language at the center of Moroccanness, which is something that we, we see in uh, some of the discourse, the other discourse of first and second generation speakers, right? If you, do, if you lack Darija, or knowledge of being able to write and, and speak the language, then you lack Moroccanness, right? So it's important for her to have Darija and Fusha, but again, in addition to Spanish. Right? Not in place of. The addition of her Moroccan identity is what makes her special, in addition to this, this uh, Spanish identity. Okay, so let's do a quick recap before we get into some of the attitudes. So, Moroccan immigrants, we see in these two cases, leverage features from, from multiple languages, and they position themselves to support multilingual practices. Right? And then, of course, th they, they use this positioning to perform belonging in various social spaces where access is typically denied within Spanish society. But we do see some limits, and this relates to how speakers perceive uh, their language use and these, these dominant, uh, these larger ideologies and discourses that they, that they are confronted with. And with this idea of being whole versus half Moroccan being sort of a, a, a big piece of this that we'll see. And so when looking at this connection between language and identity, and particularly how do speakers perceive language as a part of identity, we see that first and second generation speakers have different perspectives on what that means, what that looks like. While Lulu um, feels like it's, it's important to, be, to have uh, language as a part of her Moroccan identity, um, many first generation uh, speakers also agree with that. To be Moroccan, you must speak Moroccan Arabic, Darija. You will always be Moroccan, it's in your blood, so this connection of, of identity being origin as opposed to language, um, or biological, uh, I mean. If you're born here, you are not Moroccan, of course, being associating identity with place, right? Uh, with geography. Generation two, you don't have to speak Moroccan Arabic to be Moroccan, you don't have to speak Darija to be Moroccan, right? Um, and I think I prefer to say that I'm a citizen of the world and can speak a variety of different languages. Okay, which this piece is interesting because it came out quite frequent, frequently with the discussion with second generation um, speakers, right? So, this leads me into the third finding, which is that speakers say that being able to use language is more important than being perceived as a language user. So we'll see what that means here with some of the questionnaire data. So, uh, what we're going to look at is the responses from uh, Likert scale, scale, where speakers had to strongly disagree from strongly agree to a set of questions regarding their, their language use and the way that they hope to be perceived. So we'll look at Spanish, Fusa, and Darija in particular. So here in this case, on the left we see the answers to the question, it is important for me to be able to use Spanish as a native speaker. Orange is second generation and generation one is this pink purple color. So we see here, in, in comparison to this question, I would like others to think I'm a native speaker of Spanish. So in this case, it's more important for speakers to be able to use Spanish than pe be perceived as a Spanish speaker. And I want to point out that we will see in comparison to the other languages, generation two overall, in comparison to Fusha and Darija, it's more important for them to use and, and be perceived as a Spanish native speaker than the other languages. Okay. In for Darija, it's important for me to use or be able to use Darija as a native speaker. Again, we see it's more important for speakers to use the language than be perceived as a native speaker. But it's still relatively important for first generation speakers. In regards to Fusha, we see uh, that while it is important to use Fusha as a native speaker, being perceived as a native speaker isn't necessarily as important. As we said before, using Fusar being perceived as a native speaker of Fusa, there's an argument that no one is a native speaker of Fusa, right? And so this may be, may be part of it. Um, and it's also interesting to remember those, the way that Fusa can index certain social, social class and, and educational experience. So um, that may be, a, those are very important pieces to take into account when looking at this data. 
Okay. So again, first generation speakers would prefer they're overall more uh, in agreement with being with using Darija and being perceived as a Darija speaker, and second generation as using Spanish and being perceived as a native Spanish speaker, right? Which again also can reflect the the sort of the context that speakers find themselves in. If you're a second generation speaker, you're trying to navigate the these social spaces and maybe Spanish having more uh, capital uh, than. Uh, than Darija in the context of where they're working and going to school, right, within, within Granada. So overall, we see that these positions that speakers hold don't necessarily align with ethno-nationalist or eth even ethno-linguistic identifications, right? And we see that again sort of highlighted in the questionnaire responses, that the language use is more important than, than the perception of the being a language user, right? Overall, within these highly politicized environments, speakers are able to negotiate their subject positions to navigate monolingual and mono monocultural environments. Their attitudes point that Darija is more important. It's more important to use Darija and be perceived as a Darija native speaker for first generation, and for second generation, Spanish is more important. And overall, using language is more important than being perceived as a user of that language. So bringing that all together um, and seeing the implications of that for, for uh, their language practices and the ways that they identify. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. Yes, thank you for that question. So, What's interesting in this case, in this particular case, is that um, first, I will say that no matter what I am, it's very difficult to, to gain access to the community, particularly because they are experiencing uh, a lot of suspicion and uh, surveillance on the, in their new context in Spain. Um, and for that reason, actually being a if I, were, if I were a Spaniard, it'd be more difficult, right? Because I have friends and colleagues who've tried to do this kind of work and they haven't been able to, to get people to talk to them because this, this sort of tension that's there. Um, and I think being an outsider also uh, helps in a sense that I was able to uh, ask questions from a place of, of uh, little perceived knowledge and so they were able to really explain to me all of these different complexities that may not have come out if I were a member of the Moroccan community or even a member of the Spanish community. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in a kind of a funny way in your research, your conclusions kind of back up right. what those headlines were. Yes. Yeah. And I just, um, I, I find that interesting because it's, you know, that perception is less important. And I suppose when you think of assimilation, it's all how you yeah. perceived by other right. people. Yeah, and I think that, that that's interesting because it shows a particular agency, or I mean, yeah. it, it could be perceived agency, but it's agency on the part of the speakers themselves. Like, they, they, they recognize the utility of the language itself and not, you know, the consequences of being a speaker of that language are less important, right? So how do they, I mean, then how do they position, like, how do they feel then about their, how they're perceived in general then. So it's like, on one hand, you have these kind of aggressive headlines. Right, And then right. you have this like agency and identity as more than just one thing. And right. Kind of a bit more flexible. Right. And then how, where is, mm -hmm. how do they perceive? That sort of like the, like the type of headlines, how do they that, perceive that? Or like yeah. how they're, how they interact with other people. Native Spaniards yeah. Or yeah. Well, number one, that's also why it's very difficult to gain access because they're very aware of this type of discourse. Excuse me, like the the idea that they're that they they know that they face discrimination. They they experience it, and even if they won't say it forthright, they they have ways of like first talking and interacting with people. It's very it's very can be kind of tense and, and challenging because I remember when I first started this project. Um, a point to this integration idea. Almost all the participants, the first time I talked with them, they're like, okay, so you're here to ask me how integrated I am. 
into Spanish society? No, I'm not actually, but, th but that's because that's what they're used to hearing. They're used to, to you know, being faced with this idea of integration, right? And what that means, which in a lot of cases is assimilation. This idea of like, you have to be physically, you know, linguistically, culturally, religiously even, you have to fit in with this, this idea of what it means to be Spanish, right? And so um, they're very aware of, of this discourse. And what's interesting is that despite being very aware of this, they, they've created sort of these ways of sort of navigating those difficulties, right? You know, there's, you can't necessarily change, as an, as an individual, you know, it's harder for them to change the whole structural racism of, of not being able to find housing, but they have unique ways of sort of negotiating that, uh, you know, speaking with landlords and negotiating that, like using your Spanish or emphasizing sort of a, a Spanish way of speaking or specifically Granada way of speaking, right? For a lot of my, my participants, they also said that it helps that phenotypically, like they felt like they could fit in. So in certain contexts, I have one participant who very explicitly talked about how he, is a, he identifies as one way and sort of makes more prevalent one identity over another depending on the context, right? Because he, he recognizes the series of, sort of implications and consequences of identifying one way or another in a different type of context. So in one situation, he was um, in uh, a shop and someone asked him if he was Moroccan and the other person was Moroccan. And because he didn't really wanna get into the whole like discussion of what it, you know, because when you would, uh, being Moroccan implies a series of relation relationships or expected relationship, I guess, in that sense, he just said he was Spanish, right? So that's in one sense, but then, you know, so they, there, there's different ways of navigating this that are subtle, but participants are very, the speakers are very aware that this is what they need to do to navigate these spaces, right? But they're not willing, what, one thing was interesting is they're not necessarily willing to, which I think is, I mean, a very positive thing. They're not, they don't feel like getting rid of Mor their Moroccan identity or Darija is the answer to being able to navigate those spaces, right? They see that they can, they can use all of these different positions and all these different languages in these different ways, right? They see it as a benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was curious for the, the first example. When the right. Yes, good question. Yeah, so in Morocco, yes, you, you might hear, uh, depending on, of course, region, social status, educational background, you might hear speakers switching back and forth between French and Darija. Um, Fusha, so typically linguists describe it as like a diglossic continuum, right? So it's not like, Darija is just home and, you know, with friends and Fusha is just in religious ceremonies or formal practices and things. It's really like, there's kind of a mix, but it's also carries with it different, different um, implications. So for example, there was one instance where I was in Morocco and I was with my friend who was Moroccan and she was talking to a police officer and she was using Darija and then she felt sort of this tension um, and possible uncomfortable situation with this police officer. And so she switched to Fusha and made him laugh, right? Because it's, Fusha is associated with this very sort of high status and, and formal language. So using Fusha in that way was able to sort of break the ice with this police officer, right? Um, and so, yes, speakers, speakers use multilingual features within Morocco as well, yeah. I think just in, in Spain, they, they also add, and even of course in, in Northern Morocco, there's speakers that use Spanish as well. Like there are some families, some participants who, who said, they're the, so the, the participant themselves is their first generation, but they say that in their family, they speak with their mother in Darija and their father in Spanish because he studied in Spain and he has an affinity for Spanish culture. And so he wanted to, to, to sort of use that language with his family. So it's not, this kind of reflects a lot of the, the practices that we might see also in Morocco, I think, yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. I, I was thinking of uh, this restaurant in, in Santa Monica, Persian restaurant that had the menu in French. 
Persian and in English. And the prices in Persian were different. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and that was something interesting too. When I, so I tra when I traveled to Morocco with my Ro Moroccan friend, she was like, let me come with you. Let me come with you. Like sometimes that worked. Like so, but the fact that I spoke, spoke Fusa. So this was an interesting story where, where she thought she could negotiate a better price for me because she's Moroccan and used Darija. But then when I started speaking Fusha, because Fusha is associated with this sort of, you know, it's, it's considered better Arabic, right, uh, than Darija. And, you know, my, my background and my experience, me using Fusha, actually I was able to negotiate a lower price than she was as a Moroccan Darija speaker, right? So there's a lot of interesting layers and complexities going on with, with this language use, absolutely. That, that's a good point. That's a good story to illustrate that as well, yeah. Yes. Not necessarily. Um, and that was something, so I didn't put here, but in the field notes and in the other interviews as well. Um, of the field notes, there was about 77, 68 uh, inst you know, observations that mentioned language use, and the majority of them were actually, uh, there was an instance of, of mixing, I guess you could say, or code switching. And that was not just between, again, like this first generation. It may be more frequent for first generation to also use Spanish with their switching, but then second generation would use English as in addition to Darija and some Fusa, right? But yes, first and second generation across the board, there was a lot of code switching going on. Um, and that's something I want to continue to, to pursue because it's also interesting that first generation uses code switching so frequently. And from what I could glean from, from you know, asking them about this switching, some would say, oh, I know it's bad, but I like doing it. So indicating sort of for their attitude towards code switching. But for the most part, people really saw it as sort of this like really important skill. And they would reference like, well, us Moroccans, we're very multilingual. Like languages for us are so easy. And then of course this code switching would be an example of how languages are so easy for Moroccans. Like they have this, you know, facilidad for, for languages and using languages in those ways. Yeah, yeah. If there's no more questions or comments, then thank you very much for coming.